Another example of using standard states is when calculating phase transitions. The term phase is more specific than state, since there can be many phases in a given state. For example, for steel, whose phase diagram is provided, has many solid phases. For each phase change, there's a change of enthalpy. We will use the following conventions. In terms of notation, the standard enthalpy of vaporization is denoted as delta sub VAP of the standard enthalpy, and the standard enthalpy of fusion is denoted as delta fuse of the standard enthalpy. Following our sign convention, when these values are positive, this means that energy is transferred from the surroundings to the system, and the substance is melting or boiling. It is an unfortunate naming convention here that a positive standard change in enthalpy of fusion is the melting of a substance. For the reverse process, meaning condensation and freezing, the standard change in enthalpy is negative, meaning that the system is transferring heat to the surroundings. Also, since enthalpy is a state function, the standard change in enthalpy of vaporization and the standard change in enthalpy of fusion can be combined to get the values for sublimation and vapor deposition. In other words, moving between solid and vapor phases. So let's now calculate the standard heat of sublimation of ice at zero degrees Celsius. And what we're given basically is the standard change in enthalpy of fusion and the standard change in enthalpy of vaporization. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use Hess's law to basically determine what is the standard heat of vaporization of, or sorry, the standard heat of sublimation. So this process, what it looks like is we're changing H2O solid to H2O gas. And what we're trying to calculate here is this delta sublimation. And what we're going to end up calculating instead, since we're given these two numbers, what we can then instead calculate is here's the H2O solid. We have a small change to get to H2O liquid. And then we have a larger change to get to H2O gas. And so all we're going to do is we're just going to add up these two changes that we know that leads us to the same place, since again, enthalpy is a state function. 601, 45.07. And so all that means is that when we do this change in enthalpy calculation, that's just going to be equal to, here we've got delta H1, and here we've got delta H2. We're just going to just apply Hess's law. So I've got 601 plus 45.07, which is the standard heats of sublimate, or sorry, vaporization and fusion. And then by adding those two numbers together, what we end up with is 51.08 kilojoules per mole. And that again, this is the standard heat of sublimation. One issue with calculating the change in enthalpy is that absolute values in enthalpy are not easily determined. To get around this, the standard method is to use an indirect route. We calculate the change in enthalpy by setting the value of the elemental components to be zero. So the reactants are then broken down into their elemental components, and the products are then built up from the elements. The change in enthalpy from breaking down and building up components from their elements is called the standard heat of formation. We can then calculate the change in enthalpy using the standard heat change for the reaction is equal to the weighted sum of the standard heat of formation of the products minus the weighted sum of the standard heat of formation of the reactants. The standard enthalpy of formation of an element in its reference state, being the most stable form at standard ambient temperature and pressure, which is 1 bar and 25 degrees Celsius, is defined as zero. The idea of enthalpies of formation is similar to the idea of land elevation, that it is relative to sea level. We have just defined sea level to be zero elevation, and the height of everything is relative to that. Standard enthalpies of formation follow this same idea. Let's now do an example where we're going to calculate the enthalpy of formation, or use the enthalpy of formations to calculate the standard enthalpy of a reaction at 298 Kelvin. And the reaction we're going to look at is the breakdown or the combustion of glucose with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. However, where this is actually maybe interesting for 
for us is that this also can be used to calculate the metabolic breakdown of food. And this is because since enthalpy is a state function, it's a path-independent thing. And so if we have the same reactants and products for a given reaction, then it doesn't matter the pathway we use to calculate it. So even though in our bodies it's, it's a very complex metabolic process, in reality, we can still derive the amount of energy that we gain or the maximum amount of energy that's potentially gained through, meta, uh, through the digestion of glucose by simply doing this combustion reaction. The values that I'm going to be using for this calculation come from Wikipedia, and I would invite you to use these values in subsequent parts of the course whenever the, the internet is available so that you can then draw from this knowledge base to, to do your calculations. To start off though, we will write down just this general form of the change in the standard heat for the reaction is equal to the weighted sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the weighted sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. And in this case, the products, will we have carbon dioxide, and we have water. And so I'm just going to then just write in the weighted sum. So I have six moles heat of formation, or the standard heat of formation of water. Make sure I have my state in there. And to that I'm going to add, since this is a sum, standard heat of formation of carbon dioxide. And from that, I'm going to subtract off the weighted sum of all the reactants, which in this case is glucose and oxygen. So I've only got one glucose molecule, C6H12O6. And from that, I'm going to add on six times the standard heat of formation of oxygen. Now, a big thing to take note of is the state. And this is because, and I'm going to use water as an example, is that water could either be formed as a liquid or a gas. And it could, of course, also be ice. But the typical ones, whenever we look at these reactions, is going to be liquid or gas. And there's actually a slight difference in the enthalpy of formation for water, like liquid water and gaseous water. So again, in order to get an accurate result, we want to make sure that we have the correct, or that we use the correct phase whenever we do these calculations. And so it's always helpful to write in those phases whenever we start subbing into um, doing this calculation so that then we can make sure we keep this straight. So going to the table that I have provided with Wikipedia, then I'm going to substitute in the number. The heat of formation of liquid water is just going to be 6 times negative 285.8. We have the heat of formation of carbon dioxide. That's going to be 6 times negative 393.5. I'm going to subtract off the heat of formation of glucose, negative 1,271. And to that I'm going to add 6 times 0. And this is because the heat of formation of oxygen gas at room temperature, well this is the standard of the reference phase, the reference state, and so then that is just defined as 0. And that's why I've written in a zero here. That means that term just disappears. From here, I can then just start to evaluate. I just have algebra just to complete now. I have negative 1714.8. To that, I'm going to add negative 2361. And from that, I'm going to add and the minus minus cancels out. So I get 1271. And that means then that the heat from this reaction is negative 2,804.8 kilojoules per mole. And where these units come from is that each of these numbers that I substituted in are in kilojoules per mole. And so hence, all of the numbers, in, when I add and subtract them, they end up giving me kilojoules per mole. Taking a quick step back, just looking at what this result means, well, the negative sign, that tells us that heat was transferred from the system to the surroundings, and this is something that we would expect because, again, we're doing a combustion reaction, but also in the context of this metabolic process, we would hope that we would be transferring heat from the system, which in this case is going to be the glucose and the oxygen, and that then 
that heat then gets put into the surroundings, which is the rest of our body. And this is, again, how we're extracting useful energy out of eating food.